Welcome to this UKLA webinar on grammar. I'm hoping that this webinar will build your confidence and understanding about grammatical subject knowledge, but also that it will help you see constructive, meaningful and creative ways to think about grammar in the classroom. First of all, I just want to address the purpose of this seminar. We're, I'm looking very much at your grammatical subject knowledge. And in particular for this webinar, I'm looking very much at noun phrases and verb phrases. That choice is deliberate because those two structures are really the driving forces of, of sentences. And if you understand noun phrases and verb phrases, it often makes it much easier to understand other aspects of grammar. In that way, you could say that they're foundational understanding. So what this webinar really is addressing is your capacity to identify these terms and to have good conceptual understanding of them. But I did want to issue a bit of a health warning. As I said, I'm focusing on subject knowledge, your subject knowledge. But in the classroom, I would strongly recommend that grammar is always embedded naturally into a broader framework of learning and teaching about language. And in terms of writing, that grammar is taught in the context of playfulness and experimentation with language, creative ways to think about language and accompanying other things that we need to do in, in the teaching of writing, such as attending to the writing process and supporting children's learning of how to plan, draft, revise and edit, explicit teaching of writing, some of which might well include grammar and grammatical choices, but will include many other things as well, and lots of rich and productive talk about writing and reading and the interrelationship between the two. just start by not thinking about grammar but thinking more broadly about that idea of writing and particularly that reciprocal relationship between reading and writing the interrelatedness of reading and writing these two quotations by Smith and by Bazerman both emphasize that interrelationship and they draw out some really important points that I'd like to draw out here So if we are thinking about this relationship between being a reader and a writer, one of the first things we need to think about is how can we help children to read like writers and to draw on their own writing experience when they're reading text. As well as reading like writers, they need to see themselves as writers not just as children who produce writing in the classroom, but children who feel that as authors they can communicate and express through writing. Linked to that idea of children as authors and seeing themselves as writers is the idea that they must also believe that it's possible that the texts that they're reading and experiencing are also texts that they themselves could produce. So much of this is about how do you create classrooms where there are healthy, creative communities of writers. In some ways, Bazerman flips the focus from Smith's emphasis on writing to being a reader and he draws attention to this idea of the active reader who not only reads what the writer is saying and the ideas and the inferences but also is able to read what the white writer is doing and how the writer's choices may be affecting them as a reader. And to do that an active reader is aware of both the writer's purpose, why is the writer doing this? What does the writer want to do and achieve? And the techniques used to realise that purpose. And those techniques will include grammatical choices.
This webinar is focusing very much on your metalinguistic understanding and your knowledge of grammar. But of course, in the classroom, what we're also responsible for is developing that metalinguistic understanding in the children that we teach. And it's worth pausing here just to stop and think a little bit about what that, that means. Looking at grammar and teaching grammar shouldn't be about giving children formulaic ways of writing and telling them how they should write. It should be much more about opening up for them the sense of the possibilities that language offer them, offers them in terms of choices, what we've called the infinite repertoire of possibilities. And not just showing them the choices, but creating very rich context in the classroom for discussing how those choices create different meanings. Many of you, especially those of you who are teaching in year six, will be familiar with the current emphasis on fronted adverbials. And many of the young children we are talking to have learnt that if you put fronted adverbials in your writing, you'll make your writing better. But that's fake learning. It isn't true that putting fronted adverbials at the beginning of sentences necessarily makes your writing better. It can make your writing awkward. It can make your writing clumsy. And it may, may create an emphasis on information that you didn't want to emphasise. On the other hand, sometimes making an adverbial at the start of a sentence is a really effective thing to do. So in terms of metalinguistic understanding, we're not interested in teaching children mantras like you need to put in fronted adverbials or you should make use fronted adverbials. Instead, we're much more interested in the kind of metalinguistic understanding that generates thinking and choice. So for example, talking to children about what happens if you move that adverbial to the front of the sentence. How does it change how we read this sentence? Low-level metalinguistic understanding restricts itself to mere identification and labelling of grammatical terms. But high-level metalinguistic understanding develops that choice and ability to talk about language and use grammatical understanding to inform your decision-making. So we would argue that explicit grammatical knowledge is important only if it's supporting that kind of rich metalinguistic understanding about writing and giving children ownership of the decisions they are making about the choices for their own writing. The key message for this webinar that I will implicitly return to as we go through it is that we are interested in how an attention to grammar can integrate the teaching of reading, of writing and of talk. What we're trying to ask you to do as teachers is to get writers to look through their reading at what other writers do, but also to be the readers of their own writing. I will almost certainly mention at some point in this webinar the importance of hearing text read aloud. And that is just as true of children's own writing as of the model text that we might be looking at. It also asks the writers to think about their own readers. Many of the choices that we have to make as writers relate to what we want as our, our own purposes and rhetorical goals, that writing to do for our readers. It also invites writers to talk about and explain the language choices they've made. That links back very much to that previous comment about the, the what if and what, what effect does that change have being much more important than simply identifying or learning to deploy a fronted adverbial. It also helps children to understand how grammar choices are one way in which we manage the reader-writer relationship, which is obviously a key aspect of becoming a writer. So if we're doing all of those things, what we're doing is developing writers' metalinguistic understanding about grammar choices in writing. OK, so before we start on the grammatical subject knowledge itself, I just wanted to dip in for a moment to the idea of learning grammar and address some of the complications and complexities. Lots of people are really afraid of grammar, fearful, or sometimes ashamed that they don't know grammar. If that's you, don't be. 
Grammar, like almost all learning, is perfectly learnable. But it is important to think about why grammar might be causing problems in the way that perhaps learning the names of dinosaurs isn't. With grammar, you're not learning facts that you can memorise, but you're learning about concepts which are deeply interrelated and can be complex. So don't be too hard on yourself if you find things confusing or difficult at times. It's really hard to cram grammar knowledge. It takes time and layering and consolidation. Typically what happens is that you will develop a layer of knowledge that you feel comfortable with, and then you'll be able to layer in a deeper level of knowledge above it. Try to be really aware of that and don't expect too much of yourself too soon, but also don't give up, be persistent. Think to that, notice what it is that you're understanding well and what puzzles or confuses confuses you. This is really your metacognitive understanding of your own learning processes. And the key thing is you need to focus your attention on those areas that puzzle or confuse you, not the areas that you feel comfortable with. So target and practice areas which confuse you. And another thing that's just about brain power and capacity, stop when you feel you've had enough. Don't keep pushing on if actually your learning has ceased to be productive. Stop and come back to it later. So in this PowerPoint, I'm going to be dealing with a lot of knowledge, but you can come back to it later and revisit and test things out yourself and look at other texts and see if you can find the same things there that we've been discussing here. So let's begin to think about grammatical subject knowledge by looking at nouns and noun phrases. The decision to give an emphasis to nouns and noun phrases as part of this webinar was very deliberate. Our experience of observing in classrooms is that in general we hear much more talk about nouns than we do about noun phrases, possibly because many teachers feel more secure about nouns. But the noun phrase grammatically is really the key structure. And also in terms of what happens in written text, the noun phrase is critically important. If you understand the noun phrase, it also establishes a foundational building block for understanding objects and subjects later. Thinking about the curriculum itself, as early as year two, we are being asked to address nouns and noun phrases with children. So in year two, one strand is looking at nouns in terms of their morphology, how they're built, and how you can create nouns through adding suffixes such as ness and er. And of course, this aspect of grammatical understanding is really helpful for supporting both spelling and also reading comprehension. If you understand how morphology of words is built, you can often guess intelligently at the meaning of a word. But in year two, it also looks at expanded noun phrases for description and for specification. And it gives some example here of those expanded noun phrases, the blue butterfly, plain flower, and the man in the moon. And in this webinar, we're going to look at the slightly different structures of each of those expanded noun phrases mentioned there in year two. And in year two, both noun and noun phrase are listed as required terminology that children should use. If you then looked forward through the curriculum to year six at all those different terminology that's required in each year group, Noun and noun phrase are often fundamental to understanding all of the other terminology that follows. And likewise, in secondary school, understanding noun phrases are part of the ways in which we can talk about language choices and text choices that writers make. So let's just think a little bit about two key terminological terms here that sound difficult because they're long words and they're rather Latinate, but actually they're not too conceptually difficult to understand. And that's pre-modification and post-modification. These are really helpful for you in terms of your subject knowledge to think about the structure of noun phrases. Whether you need to teach children those terms, I think is a moot point. 
I would suggest that in year two, this is just too complex, but we have very successfully observed lessons where teachers are using pre-modification and post-modification in year five and six to help children understand the structure of the noun phrase. So pre-modification really simply means the extra information, and that extra information is describing the noun or specifying the noun, giving more information about the noun, and it's the extra information which comes before the noun, which is being described. That's why it's pre-modification. Post-modification, on the other hand, is the extra information which comes after the noun, which is being described. And we're going to look at both of these in this webinar. It makes sense to begin with pre-modified noun phrases because they're the simplest noun phrases to understand. And indeed, in speech, they are often the first stage of development of a noun phrase is that children move from simply saying a word to being able to expand it with a pre-modified noun phrase. And the beauty of the pre-modified noun phrase is that there are only a limited number of ways in which you can create it. So these are some of the patterns that you will get in a pre-modified noun phrase. The most basic ones are just the determiner plus noun, the house, an apple, each peach, both pairs. Um, then the other simple one is the determiner plus adjective plus noun. Every, the determiner, read the adjective and letter the noun. Or a, uh, the de determiner, tiny brown, so you've got two adjectives there and egg the noun. And actually, the interesting thing in English is that you can have as many adjectives as you want before a noun. And sometimes authors play around with that. So you can think about an itsy, witsy, teeny, weeny, yellow polka dot bikini. That's a pre-modified noun phrase with a determiner, a, uh, and the noun bikini, and then a whole string of adjectives pre-modifying it. And then you can have a determiner plus an adverb, plus an adjective, plus a noun such as a deliciously dark chocolate. And less commonly, but sometimes you will get noun phrases that are pre-modified but have no determiner, um, as in red letters, civil society, and deliciously dark chocolates. You can see there that sometimes there's a connection between the singular and the plural, where the singular, a deliciously dark chocolate, has a determiner, but the plural doesn't, deliciously dark chocolates. And one thing about pre-modified noun phrase is the noun which is being modified is always at the end of a pre-modified noun phrase. So you can see that on all of these, you know, letter, egg, chocolate, letters, society, chocolates. They're at the end. Um, but you do need to be aware, actually, that the noun could also be post-modified. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on, that you can have a pre-modified noun phrase, which is also post-modified. Don't you have a little think about this by looking at a very familiar text that we all know and love, Michael Rosen's We're Going on a Bear Hunt. Just have a look at this and decide where do you think the pre-modified noun phrases are in this little verse? Here they are. They're all quite simple ones. A bear hunt, so hunt is the noun, and a uh and a bear are giving you more information about that noun, so they're pre-modifying. A big one, one is the noun. A beautiful day, a river, and here's a lovely example of a very simple pre-modified noun phrase is being expanded to become um, a longer expanded noun phrase. A river becomes a deep, cold river. A rather nice way to think about pre-modified noun phrases is to think a little bit about how they work in traditional fairy tales. Because traditional fairy tales are oral narratives, um, they often use a lot of pre-modified noun phrases drawn from a stock of noun phrases that are used again and again and again in the telling of tales. So just have a little think. Can you think of any typical noun phrases that you might associate with the telling of a fairy tale, and then try to think about, are they pre-modified noun phrases? 
Here are some. A wicked stepmother, an enchanted forest, a golden egg, a handsome prince, a magic wand, an ugly duckling. Again, they're very simple. They're drawing on these stock, well, they're stock nouns in terms of stepmothers, forests, eggs, princes, wands and ducklings being typical things that occur in fairy tales. But so are the adjectives typical, wicked, enchanted, golden, handsome, magic, ugly. And each one of these is that structure of determiner plus adjective plus noun phrase. So you can really play with that in the telling of a traditional fairy tale that these are typical pre-modified noun phrases. But let's move on to something a little bit different from the fairy tale and move to Roald Dahl. This is taken from Matilda. And I just want to read this aloud because, as I said earlier, the importance of hearing text read aloud helps you to hear what a text sounds like. And if it's your own writing, it helps you to become the reader of your own writing. But I want you to hear this just to enjoy and think about the quality of the description that is created here. This clot boomed the headmistress, pointing the riding crop at him like a rapier. This blackhead, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule that you see before you is none other than a disgusting criminal, a denizen of the underworld, a member of the maf mafia. It's a really rich description, and we're going to come back to that rich description after we've looked at this a little bit. But first of all, just to look at this yourself and try and decide where are the pre-modified noun phrases? And remember what you've learned already, that in a pre-modified noun phrase, the noun will be at the end of that noun phrase, and it will be preceded by a determiner, a determiner and an adjective, a, a determiner and adverb or an adjective, or no determiner and an adverb or an adjective. So just have a go and see if you can find the noun phrases in this. A look at these. It's full of noun phrases, partly because what Roald Dahl has done is used a, a listing technique and there's a lot of listed noun phrases there. But here what I've done is underline the pre-modified noun phrases and the noun, the head noun, which is being described is in red. So you've got this clot, the headmistress, the riding crop, a rapier, this blackhead, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule, a disgusting criminal, a denizen, the underworld, a member and the mafia. And you might want to come back to this presentation later and just see if you can break down whether um, it's determiner, adjective, adjective plus adverb and noun and what the structure is. But just have a look a little bit more. There are a few problems here. What about a denizen of the underworld? That's clearly um, a unit of meaning, but it's got two noun phrases in it, a denizen and the underworld. And what about a member of the mafia? That's a bit puzzling. Um, this one. This poisonous pustule that you see before you, there's another example of a, a unit of meaning that seems to go together, but it's got that you see before you after that pre-modified noun phrase. I hope at this point that you feel reasonably confident with that idea of the pre-modified noun phrases. So I just want to move that subject on a little bit. In terms of noun phrases, you can have a single noun all on its own, such as Charlie, single noun, it's a proper noun, felt it worst of all. Or you can have a pre-modified noun phrase on its own. It still wasn't nearly enough for a growing boy. Or you can have a pre-modified noun phrase, which is also post-modified. Charlie could see great slabs of chocolate. 
And that was what you were seeing in those examples earlier on, um, where you've got a denizen of the underworld. You've got post-modification and pre-modification. And you can also have a post-modified noun phrase on its own with smiles of pleasure. So smiles is the noun that's being described there. And then of pleasure is providing more information about the nature of those smiles. So we're going to look a little bit more now at that idea of the post-modified noun phrase. Post-modification is a little bit more complex and more difficult than pre-modification because there are a lot more ways that you can post-modify a noun. And also you have to think a lot more about is that information telling me more about the noun or is that actually a new bit of information in the sentence? So post-modification is just a little bit more difficult. And you might want to revisit this or practice this by looking at text yourself when you're reading them and trying to see how these are happening. We're only going to look today at four ways to post-modify because I don't want to over-complicate it or confuse you. And I'm using what are largely some of the most common ways of post-modification. And these are using prepositional phrases, relative clauses, what are called reduced relative clauses, which are nearly always non-finite clauses, and adjectives. So if we look at those relative, the prepositional phrases, you can see there the boy, there's your pre-modified noun phrase, but then extra information is added after it to tell you more about the boy. There's the post-modification, and it's a prepositional phrase, in the striped pyjamas. The same, cider is the noun, and then it's post-modified with extra information, cider with Rosie. Or a house, there's the noun, of cards. And one reason that people sometimes get confused is actually what you've got here is in each of those prepositional phrases, there is a noun phrase, the striped pyjamas, rosy and cards. And it is true that in the noun phrase, you can have a noun phrase. So the boy in the striped pyjamas is a single noun phrase because it's all describing the boy. And that's one thing to think about a little bit more. A relative clause, um, again, adds additional information after the noun. A chimney, which was leaning sideways. The girl who always cried. And the reduced relative clauses um, are very similar structures because you've simply taken out the bit that made it a relative clause, the verb and the, um, the relative pronoun. So a chimney, which was leaning sideways, can be reduced to a chimney leaning sideways. Leaning sideways there is a non-finite clause. And you can see how it's a reduced relative clause overall. But also you can have each boat stripped to its timbers. Again, stripped to its timbers is a non-finite clause. And finally, you can have adjectives added after the noun rather than before the noun, which would be their normal position. And this is quite a literary way of writing. Her fingers long, white and dancing. And of course, by putting that extra information after the noun, you're drawing attention to the adjectival description, long, white and dancing, rather than drawing attention to the fingers. So that post-modification um, is a very versatile way of adding additional information to your nouns. And one key way to test whether something is, is post-modification is that you can nearly always take away the post-modification and although you remove detail, the paragraph or the sentence will still make sense without it. So you could just you could say the boy in the striped pyjamas came down the stairs or the boy came down the stairs. A chimney which was leaning sideways fell off. A chimney fell off. The girl who always cried decided to stop crying. The girl decided to stop crying. So that's one way that you can test it out. You do just have to be aware that it's not a, it's not a foolproof rule. So a house of cards is an interesting example because if you take away the of cards, you're losing something from that description that probably means that that sentence would lose its meaning. So it's not a foolproof test, but it does tend to work. So let's go back to those questions I asked you before about that little extract from Roald Dahl, where there were the three noun phrases that actually 
cause a little bit of a problem if you're only thinking about them in terms of pre-modified noun phrases. The first one was that this poisonous pustule that you see before you. The second noun phrase is a denizen of the underworld. And the third one is a member of the mafia. And I've used colour here to highlight the structure. So the brown is the pre-modification. The red is the head noun, the noun that's being described. And then the purple is the post-modification. So just have a look at them and think yourself about the purple. What is doing the post-modification in those three examples? So in that first example, this poisonous pustule that you see before you, that you see before you is a relative clause beginning with the relative pronoun that. And it's giving you further information about that pustule. And in the other two, you've got prepositional phrases, a denizen of preposition, the underworld, and a member of preposition, the mafia. And in both prepositional phrases, there's that slight confusion that you've got another noun phrase, the underworld and the mafia. But the key thing is the whole thing is the noun phrase, a denizen of the underworld, because you've got the head noun denizen followed by a prepositional phrase. So you might be thinking, well, what on earth is the point of ever teaching noun phrases, apart from the fact that children are going to be tested on it in the grammar test? Actually, there's a lot of point in teaching the noun phrase. Let's just go back to that description um, from Roald Dahl. And I want to read the paragraph before as well here. And as I'm reading it, think about how does Dahl's choice of description in that list of noun phrases that we've been looking at and the fact they are listed help to create the character of Mrs. Trunchbull, who's the head, headmistress in this. The boy stood to one side. He looked nervous. He knew very well he wasn't up there to be presented with a prize. He was watching the headmistress with an exceedingly wary eye, and he kept edging farther and farther away from her with little shuffles of his feet, rather as a rat might edge away from a terrier that's watching it from across the room. His plump, flabby face had turned grey with fearful apprehension. His stockings hung about his ankles. This clot, boomed the headmistress, pointing the riding crop at him like a rapier. This blackhead, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule that you see before you is none other than a disgusting criminal, a denizen of the underworld, a member of the mafia. I don't know what you thought about that description, but when you see the description of the boy in the first paragraph, there's very little there that suggests anything about him being a criminal or a member of the mafia. In fact, he sounds like a rather pathetic figure. So there's something here about this description which makes Mrs. Trunchbull, the headmistress, seem ridiculous, but it also makes her seem very over the top. That long list of ways, things that she calls the boy. Um, and how they kind of increase in ridiculousness, a clot, a blackhead, a carbuncle, a pustule, a criminal, an underworld, a member of the mafia. And through those choices of noun phrases, Dahl makes us infer about the character of Mrs. Trunchbull. It's a very good example of show not tell. So I hope now you're feeling a little bit more confident about the structure of the noun phrases, the difference between pre-modified and post-modified noun phrases, the fact that you can have a noun phrase that is both pre-modified and post-modified, and that noun phrases are really important in our writing. The next four slides just give you a chance to practice on your own what you've learnt about noun phrases, all based on this authentic menu from a Devon pub. If you go through the next few slides, you'll see, and I hope it's self-explanatory, how each of these are noun phrases and how they're structured.
let's switch our attention now from nouns and noun phrases to their partner, verbs and verb phrases. If I asked you the question, how would you define a verb, what might your answer be? To pick up here on the problem of what I've called the doing word, quite often that the common definition given of a verb in classrooms is that the verb is a doing word. And I'd just like to pause and address why this might be an unwise thing to say about verbs and how it might not help children to develop strong conceptual understanding of the verb. For a start, if you look at that sentence, that definition, a verb is a doing word, what would you say is the verb in that sentence? The truth is the verb is is, but the word which looks most like it's doing something is that adjective doing in that noun phrase, a doing word. So you can see how that notion of explaining a verb as a doing word can be um, a confusing thing for children. And this is because actually when you look at real texts, and you might do this after this webinar, um, most, a lot of verbs don't seem to be doing words at all. One example is that the verbs be and have are often the most frequent verbs in a text. But they're not obviously doing words at all, because in a way they're verbs of state or verbs of, of having, verbs of being and having. So that doesn't help because that's a confusion for children. Likewise, when you really look at sentences or phrases, often the word which seems to evoke the notion of doingness in a sentence isn't the verb. So with these two sentences, I love hunting and I saw the dream catcher. When we've talked to children about them, Many, many of them will pick hunting and dream catcher as the verb because they seem to evoke that notion of activity and doing much more strongly than the verbs in green, the idea of love and of saw. So the way English moves words around and conveys meaning in different words can mislead if you only think that a verb is a doing word. The other issue with talking about doing words is that in order to understand the clause, you need to understand that actually the verb is often a verb phrase. In other words, it isn't just one word. It could be three words in a sequence as here. I could have danced all night. And we're going to look at those verb phrases a little more in this presentation. So if you're talking to children about verbs, try to avoid saying that a verb is a doing word. In fact, it's often best to avoid definitions at all because they're very difficult in grammar. Many grammar books don't define words at all. They simply give examples. So, a logical starting point for thinking about the verb, and one that gets away from that definition of a verb being a doing word, is to address understanding of the verbs be and have. They are very high frequency verbs in English, and they're important building blocks in the verb phrase, as we'll see a bit later on. And if you look at the, the examples here in the box, the verb be only has eight possible forms. Be, am, are, is, was, were, being and being. And the verb have only has four, have, has, had, having. And unlike many other verbs, which can also be nouns or adjectives in different contexts, these variations are always verbs, with that slight exception of the word being in the verb to be, which could be a human being where it's a noun. But in general, all of the others can't be nouns or adjectives, so they're good ones to know about. And another reason why these are good to look at particularly for younger children, is that it can be very helpful for EAL students because they're understanding about how language is structured in English. So I'd really encourage you at Key Stage 1 to ensure that all the children in your classes know that these are verbs so that they can see them as verbs when they encounter them in text and they won't be confused by that idea of a verb being a doing word.
I'm going to introduce a new term now, lexical verbs, because I think it is a helpful term in terms of your understanding of the verb and the verb phrase. I'm not so sure that it's necessary for children to learn it, um, but it is helpful for you. And lexical verbs, in a, in a nutshell, are those verbs that you'd look up in a dictionary um, if you were trying to find out what a word meant. They're often the words that are closest to that idea of the doing verbs. It can also be helpful for children, I think, to divide them into these three categories of action verbs, reporting verbs and sensing verbs. The action verbs are the ones that are closest to that idea of a doing verb because the actions are very obvious, as in jump, dance, eat or ache. But they do also express actions where you sometimes have to think a bit harder to recognise that they are actions, such as organise, lead and survive. The reporting verbs you'll all be familiar with for when you're looking at children's writing of narrative and they relate to speech and how things are said. So verbs such as whisper, suggest, exclaim or shout. And then the sensing verbs, which often are the ones where children are, can't spot them as verbs because there's not much doing in them. The words that express thinking and feeling or understanding. And typical verbs here might include believe, know, imagine, enjoy, fear, see or hear. So why don't you test this out a little bit? Here's an extract from an information text about kangaroos. Um, where are the verbs in this text? Can you see where the verbs are? So here are the verbs in this passage, highlighted in green. Most of them are single word verbs, but do notice that little pair towards the end where food can be scarce. You have two verbs in a sequence, and that's an example of a verb phrase, which we'll look at later. But before we leave this text, let's just pause and look at it as an information text. Notice how the present tense is used here to create a sense of the generalisation of the information that's being provided. This is sometimes called the universal present tense because it's suggesting that it's true in the past, it's true now and it will be true in the future. And it's a very common way of writing information texts. So that's something that you could highlight to children in the classroom if they're writing information texts. And also notice how high frequency the verb to be is in that text, linking back to what I said earlier about how prominent the verbs to be and to have are in many texts in English. I'd like you to play around a little bit now with the verbs. If you just take the verb waste, a lexical verb, how many different versions of that verb can you produce beginning with a pronoun? And obviously you can vary the pronouns. I've given you five examples here just to kind of exemplify what I mean. But you could think about variation in tense. You could think about variations which use the verb be and have in front of that lexical verb waste. Or you could think about variations which use could, should and will. How many different varieties can you produce in the next four or five seconds? I don't know how many you produced, but there's quite a lot, particularly if you vary um, the pronouns and you vary the tense in a systematic way. You could come up with 10 to 15 or more. What I'm highlighting here, though, are verb phrases. The green underlined words in these examples are verb phrases, including, curiously, when there's only one verb. In the classroom, I think it's helpful to talk about verbs and verb phrases. And when it's a single verb like waste, I talk about the verb. But when there are two words, as in are wasting, I talk about the verb phrase, phrases. 
but strictly speaking, waste is a verb phrase. But notice that in those examples, most of the examples have more than one verb together. And most of your examples will have more than one verb together. And it's that string of verbs that makes the verb phrase. So let's look at this a little bit more. It does help you in your work if you are clear of that difference between lexical verbs, which I've already introduced, auxiliary verbs and modal verbs, because they help with that understanding of the structure of the verb phrase. So here I've got another list of var variations on that verb dance, this time all using the pronoun I. It could, of course, be, have been another pronoun like you or we, or a noun like Jane or the man. But there you've got, again, that single lexical verb dance, but also other variations on that verb phrase with up to four there should have been dancing. In fact, with some verbs, you can get to five when you've got a rather strange construction, such as I should have been being dancing, which doesn't quite work with dancing. So just to reiterate that notion of the lexical verb, the lexical verb is the main verb in the verb phrase, and it's the one you'd look up in the dictionary. And actually, all of those um, verb phrases here are about dancing, and they express different shades of meaning related to dancing. That's why it's the main verb. And look at the position of that lexical verb. It's either freestanding on its own, as in that first example, I dance, or it's last in the verb phrase. So that's something else that helps you with knowing where the verb phrase ends. It will always end with that lexical verb. So the second one is the auxiliary verb. And here you'll understand why I was stressing the importance of the verb be and have, because the verbs be and have are the most common lex uh, auxiliary verbs in English. Informal language in particular, though, sometimes does use do or get as an auxiliary verb. And here you can see those auxiliary verbs highlighted in purple. I am dancing. I was dancing. I had danced. I have danced. I might be dancing and I should have been dancing. And that should have been dancing highlights that actually you can have two or three of those auxiliary verbs in a verb phrase. Particularly if you have that example I mentioned earlier, I should have been being dancing, which doesn't make sense with dancing. But you have been being is, is a perfectly legitimate run of three auxiliary verbs in one verb phrase. And again, you've still got that lexical verb at the end. Finally, the modal verb, which actually many teachers are quite confident with. One reason the modal verb is easy is because it's a, a, a constrained group of about nine verbs um, and they're easily recognisable. But the modal verb is a very important aspect of a verb phrase because it really is gives us that capacity to express shades of possibility and certainty. You just have to think about that difference between could, should and might and the, the different certainties that they express. And you can see here that the modal verb always comes first in the verb phrase. Some people will also say that modal verbs are auxiliaries. In some ways, it's quite helpful, I think, to think about them um, as modal verbs in their own right. 
So there you've got that structure of a verb phrase. It could be just a lexical verb, as in I dance. It could be the lexical verb plus auxiliary verbs, as in I am dancing, I was dancing and I had dancing. Or it could be a modal verb plus an auxiliary verb plus the lexical verb, as in the last three. And in a nutshell, that is the structure of the verb phrase. So here's a plot extract from Abby Elphinstone's fantasy novel Sky Song. Just have a look at it and see if you can identify the verbs and the verb phrases. So here they are. Again, I've highlighted them in green and you can see that there's a mixture of the, the verb phrases which are single verbs like shot and tumbled and the verb phrases which are multiple um, verbs in a sequence such as was looking, was making, was running and then one with three could have hoped. All of those are verb phrases. And just pausing to think about this as a piece of narrative, if you look closely at this, it's the simple past tense where it's a single verb, which is narrating the plot that's happening now. In that first paragraph, it's all part of the narrative explanation of what Flint and Esker are doing now. It then moves in the second paragraph to what happens when Esker's opened a box. And to start with, you've got those simple past um, verbs twisted fell felt but then it moves to um, the past progressive aspect as she thinks about her past it's expressing a time beyond the past that's being narrated at this moment an earlier past if you might say was sledging was hunting was making and that could have hoped for, which is quite a complex structure is something of a more reflective construction so this little extract shows just how much that ability to be able to be flexible in the verb phrases that you use in a narrative can help you jump between simple chronological narration of something that happened in the past through to narration of thoughts from earlier in that narrative past and reflection. And here's another example for you, have to, for you to have a go at and test out your learning. This one has got one slightly tricky corner. You might want to look for a verb phrase that seems to have a word in it that's not a verb phrase. I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. Look and find the verbs and verb phrases here. OK, so here they are again, highlighted in green for you. And the one that I wanted to draw attention to was this one here. The curtains were never drawn in that house because it's a quite a common example of a verb phrase were drawn that's interrupted by an adverb. Most commonly, it's actually not the negative, not were not drawn, but never also goes there. So one of the few things that can interrupt that verb sequence in a verb phrase is some of these adverbs but it is still a verb phrase because you can take that adverb away and you still see that those verbs go together so the curtains were drawn in that house or the curtains were never drawn in that house the never simply alters that shift 
um, from being the positive to the negative. And again, you've got an example where you've got that mixture of single verb phrases, single word verb phrases, and words that use auxiliary, such as was, and then you've got the modal in could have squeezed it. So even in this short extract, you can see how common it is in English for us to have this variety in the way we structure our verb phrases. And of course, you can also see the prevalence and dominance again of the verb to be with all those was and wases. I'm going to bring this webinar to an end now, but I did want to address that with verbs and verb phrases, we've only just begun to start on the whole issue of verbs and verb phrases. I'm hoping that what I've done is get you confident with that idea that a verb can exist either as a single word or as a structure in a verb phrase where it may have two, three or four verbs in a row. But I also want to highlight what this web webinar has not really had time to address. We've done nothing really about the perfect and progressive aspect, apart from that mention of how Abby Elphinstone uses the past progressive in her narration. We've not really looked at finite and non-finite verbs or infinitives or bare forms. We've not looked at present and past participles. And we've not looked at clauses. And there are many other aspects of verbs which we haven't looked at. That's partly because verbs are such a big driver of communication in the sentence or the clause. But if you do understand the verb phrase, what I can reassure you is that's giving you that basic understanding that allows you to build from that over time. So I'd like to just bring what we've done together in a plenary point. Earlier on in this webinar, I talked a little bit about you developing your subject knowledge and tried to reassure you about the way that you can't learn it all at once and that it's good to confront some of the things that confuse you. One of the things that confuses lots of people about grammar is the way that it's rather like Russian dolls. And just as you think you've got something, you realise there's something else inside it or that it goes inside something else. It's part of that layeredness and interrelatedness of grammar. And one aspect of this is the way that a single word or a phrase can have different labels at once. So the garden is a noun phrase. You can describe that noun phrase as a determiner the and a noun garden, but actually that noun phrase could also be the subject or the object of a clause. A relative clause is a clause, but it's also part of a noun phrase. In fact, relative clauses are always adjectival because they're always in a noun phrase giving more information about the noun. And particularly confusing for lots of teachers that I've worked with is the fact that a prepositional phrase can be an adverbial phrase. And they'll say, well, how can it be both? It's partly because preposition is a word class, whereas adverbial is a part of syntax. I can't develop that here, but that's an important difference. So a prepositional phrase describes its structure. It's a phrase that's formed of a preposition at the start and then nearly always a noun phrase after it. But that prepositional phrase can be adverbial. And as you've already seen from the noun phrases, those prepositional phrases can be adjectival when they're in a noun phrase. So even explaining that, you can see why it is that people can get confused by the fact that different labels can occur at once. The best thing to do is to accept that and try to think logically about it and avoid thinking that there's a single grammatical label for a word or a phrase. And thinking about this idea of teacher subject knowledge, which is largely what this webinar is addressing, I think it is important to understand that your knowledge, your knowledge of grammar needs to be much better and more confident than that of the children you teach largely because the kinds of questions that they understand will often throw you if you don't have good subject knowledge. In fact, they can often throw you even when you do have good subject knowledge. One of the things I often say is if you don't know the answer, don't try and make it up. Take the question that the child has asked and say, I'll go away and see if I can find the answer to that. But it also helps you 
cope with their misunderstandings. Those things that we've talked about in this presentation in different ways, you know, the verb phrases having two or three verbs in a sequence, the fact that a prepositional phrase can be in a noun phrase or it can be adverbial, the fact that a verb is not always a doing word. It's really helpful if you've got the strength of grammar knowledge to help address those kinds of problems that children will typically face. But grammar knowledge isn't just about that identification and labelling. Our research in classrooms would suggest that effective grammar knowledge has got three strands. Now, that first layer is the grammatical knowledge per se, but I'd stress that phrase and syntax level is e arguably more important even than word class level. And we see most teachers working at word class level. In terms of writing and language use, the most significant choices that writers tend to make are not at word level, but are at phrase and syntax level. The other aspect of grammatical knowledge is that capacity to notice how grammatical choice is functioning, what's it doing in published texts that you see. This might be the books and the texts that you're reading, but also environmental print that you see around you. And then finally, the capacity to look at children's own writing and be able to notice what it is that might be their natural next steps for those writers in terms of the kind of choices that they're making. Are they, for example, um, sticking to noun phrases that tend to be pre-modified and need to learn about how they could provide additional information and description through that post-modification? Are they, for example, finding it difficult to express in a narrative when there's a past time beyond the chronology of the narrative and need to know about how to use that past progressive or past perfect way of writing? If you want further resources to use to develop your own subject knowledge and to link it with the classroom, I'd strongly recommend Eve Byrne and David Reedy's book about teaching grammar effectively in primary schools, which has a new edition that's currently available. If it's the strict subject knowledge that you want, our book, Essential Primary Grammar, was written for teachers and goes through it from a teacherly perspective. We've based all that we've written on the national curriculum requirements and on David Crystal's definitions of grammar so that it's consistent with the national curriculum. If you want to just self-test a little bit more on your own subject knowledge, we developed a, a, an internet website, Cyber Grammar, that you can go into. And if you want more practical resources um, for, for the classroom that exemplify ways in which you can move beyond just simply getting children to identify and label grammatical terms to look more constructively at embedding it in the teaching of writing, we've got lots of resources on our website and that website is constantly changing.